Props out and shout outs to the, the moms of Cross. I'm so grateful for all of our Crosstown moms, um, especially my mom, right? I gave a shout out to the first service. You weren't here, though. So I was hoping you'd come today, and uh, I knew you'd come. And, and also my wife, Erin, I'm very, very thankful for both of them, uh, that without their sustaining presence in my life, I probably wouldn't be here, right? Seriously, for 41 years, they have helped sustain my life. My mom, for 23 years under her care, my wife, 18 years, uh, for the last 40, 41 years, that's what they've been doing. So if you do the math, um, in five years... My, my mom could blame my wife, Erin, for everything that's wrong with me. Because <laughs> I would have been in my wife's care more than my mom. So, anywho, seriously, though, if you think about it, a mom's work is never done. A mom, a mom, amen, moms? <laughs> Right? A mom's work is never done. For those moms who have raised a son or daughter, you know that while giving birth was excruciating and painful. I will not speak of that today. Only you know. While that was hard, you know in your heart that your work was just getting started at that point, right? You had to feed them. You had to raise them. And even when you sent them out into the wild, your work was still not done. Your role may have changed, and if you have young kids, you will learn this, but your title, mom, remained the same. You still long to be present with them. You still long to uh, enter into their pain, right, moms? You still long to give them advice, whether they ask for it or not. That was a joke, moms. <laughs> but I just want to take this opportunity to honor our moms on Mother's Day. And, and recognize, really, recognize that a mom's work is never done. Now, that phrase, it's never done, is interesting because as I was thinking about in preparation for this message and what I wanted to share with you, this is not a Mother's Day message, but thinking about how a mother's work is never done, it got me thinking how Jesus' work is really never done as well. In fact, the title of my message is, His Work is Never Done. Now, I shared that with our campus pastors, and, and a few of them were like, well, is that right? That doesn't sound right. I thought, was, I, thought, I thought when he said, it is finished, it was finished. Well, that's true. In, in one sense, he's already done everything he needed to do in order to obtain our salvation, to purchase our salvation. So the, the, the cross is complete. The work on the cross is complete. It is finished in one sense. And yet, his work is never done. His work is never done. I wonder how many of us have ever really considered um, what Jesus is doing right now. Think about that. Have you ever really considered what Jesus is doing like right now on this Mother's Day? What is he doing? If, if I could say it like this, you'll, you'll see it on the screen. Um, you and I know what Jesus did, but the question is, what is Jesus doing? We know what Jesus has done in the past, because when we read our Bibles and we, we, we are told the gospel story, he died for us on the cross in the past. We know what he's done, but have we ever really considered what he's currently doing? For many people, functionally speaking, their view of what Jesus is doing currently right now is not all that much. I mean, for a lot of people, maybe, I don't know, maybe Jesus is hanging out in heaven, having a Mother's Day brunch today with his mom. Uh, maybe it's just, you know, later this afternoon he's going to build some mansions because in the Bible it talks about how there will be many rooms and Jesus got to get the house prepared for where we're going to live. And so I guess that's what Jesus is doing. But then tomorrow he'll just kind of be hanging around waiting for the Father to give him the green light to go back to earth to make everything that was wrong right, the second coming. But is that, like, is that true? Is that an accurate picture of what Jesus' current work in ministry is all about? Or have we kind of gotten off balance about what Jesus' current ministry is all about? Have you ever really considered what Jesus is doing? And here, here's another question, church. Have you ever really considered the implication of what his current work is in light of his deepest heart towards you? Like, what is his feelings and his posture towards you as a result of what he's actually doing? Um, I got to be honest with you. It had, it's been a long, long time since I had ever even really given thought to that. 
there's so much of our, our Christian conversation when it comes to the Bible or small groups or Bible studies or at church that we talk about what Jesus has done. It's like an objective historical event about in the past, like what Jesus died for me on the cross and Jesus rose again. We just celebrated that on Easter. It's all about what Jesus has done in the past. We don't often talk about what Jesus is currently done. And I hadn't thought about that in like a long time until I started reading the book that I mentioned um, a few weeks ago, Gentle and Lowly, and, and one of the chapters talks about this very subject. And so thankfully, through the scripture that we're going to look at today in Hebrews chapter 7, uh, we're going to learn more about Jesus's heart towards us, specifically what he's doing in the present moment and how that should literally shape our lives today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, if you don't, you can follow along on the screen. So go ahead and put that up on the screen. I'm going to read to you Hebrews 7, 23 through 25. Hebrews chapter 7, 23 through 25 says this, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. We're going to spend the majority of our time on this particular verse right here, but uh, before we do that, I think there's, there's a couple things we need to point out and really grasp in the first two verses. So put verse 23 on the screen there, guys. It says, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death. So you got all these people that perhaps at some point in their life, life was going okay. They, were, they had a purpose and a plan and, and they had direction, but at some point, here's what happened. They died. That verse to me is a reminder that this world is ravaged by sin and death, and even the good things in life are so temporary, they slip through our hands, and all of us experience the brokenness of this world. Every single thing that you experience in life will eventually let you down and fail you. And every single person in your life will eventually leave you. That's the reality. That's the reality of life. And, and if you dwell on that reality long enough, church, it'll leave you very, very hopeless. You'll have no hope whatsoever, but that is not the hope that we have, church. What is our hope? Our hope is verse 24. We don't have dead priests standing in behalf of, on behalf of us in front of God. We have a permanent priest. We have Jesus who continues forever so that whenever life is falling apart and things aren't working out well and that person left you because they died or that person let you down and betrayed you or that situation is weighing you down, guess what? We have a permanent priest that stands in front of God on our behalf and gives us strength now. That is good news, really good news. And it's the foundation in which we're going to talk about the rest of this message because verse 25 says, consequently, consequently. So because we have a permanent priest, there's some consequences or there's some implications as a result. So I want to spend the majority of our time just looking at this Jesus, beholding this Jesus, uplifting this Jesus who is our permanent priest who lasts forever, even when life falls apart. And I want to answer two questions. And they're, they're implicated in, this, in this, this passage, in this verse. The first question is, how does Jesus save us? How does Jesus save us? More than what we, we think we know, like in our head, like Jesus, you know, loves me, died for me on the cross. There's, there's more to it. There's more to it. So how does Jesus save us? And what is this? It is a result. The second question is this. What does Jesus live to do? What does Jesus live to do even to today? So the first question, here's the first point, and we'll answer the first question first. Jesus saves to the uttermost. That's what the scripture said. In verse, 20, verse 25, it says again, he says, he is able to save to the uttermost. Christian, aren't you thankful for that? And if you're not, if you're kind of like, you know, apathetic towards that statement or apathetic towards God, can I just remind you the reason why he needs to save to the uttermost is because you sin to the uttermost. You never stop sinning. You sin in big ways, you sin in small ways. 
Uh, you, you, you do sins of omission and commission. You know what that means? You commit sins. So when the Bible says, do not do this, right? Do not do this, Ten Commandments. What do we do? I'll do that, right? I commit sins. It's a sin of commission. But we also do sins of omission, which we don't even talk about a lot in the church. There's so many commands in the Bible that we don't, well, I didn't murder someone, you know, I didn't, I didn't sleep with someone who wasn't my wife, I, was, I didn't do that, I didn't do this. But he's, he's also giving you commands to go into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, you know, on and on. All these commands are in the positive that we're called to do and live out our purpose, but we don't do. So even if you obeyed all the Ten Commandments, but you didn't obey the things that God has told you to do in the New Testament about the, you know, how Christians should act and what they should do and the responsibilities of a Christian, you're still sinning. Like, it's never-ending. It's, it's, and even if you do good things, church, even our good deeds are stained in sin when we do them in the wrong way or, or with the wrong motives. You know what that's called? Pride. Impure motives. There's so many things that I've done good in my life that they probably were sinful because I did them for the wrong reasons. That's sin. I love how in the book Gentle and Lowly, um, he references a lot of Puritan writers. And one of the things he says in his book, Dane Ortland says, is that, or he points to the Puritan writers, says that even our, even our tears, you know, like the tears where we feel bad about what we do. So that's a good thing, feeling bad about what we do. Even our tears of repentance need to be washed by the blood of Jesus because they're not pure. We, we so fall short of the glory of God that we need, whether you realize it or not, we need to be saved to the uttermost. The other thing that phrase kind of points to in the scriptures is that we know that Jesus is both the author and the, the sustainer of our faith. He's the, he's the starter and the sustainer. He not only begins something of us, but he needs to complete that for us. Otherwise, we would be hopeless as, as well. Uh, and so he doesn't just save us in the past only to leave us to fend for ourselves in the present. Does that make sense? It's not like, well, I, you know, I died for you on the cross, so now good luck. Hope you get it right this time. The slate is clean, but now it's all on you. No, no, no. That's not our Jesus. The Bible says that he who began a good work will also be the one to carry it to completion. He saves to the uttermost. That's very, very important for us to understand. One of the things I really want you to understand for this message is, is that there is no sin in your past that you've done, no sin in the present that you're currently doing, no sin in the future that you will do that falls outside of God's eternal salvation work in your life. It all is under the forgiveness and grace of Jesus. And the reason why is because he saves to the uttermost. I love what Dane Ortland says. Um, if you're reading the book, it's on page 83 of that book. If not, it doesn't really matter. Just listen to this quote. You'll see it on the screen. He, he says, we all tend to have some small pocket of our life where we have difficulty believing the forgiveness of God reaches. Uh, we say we're, we're totally forgiven, and we sincerely believe our sins are forgiven pretty much anyway. But there's that one deep, dark part of our lives, even our present lives, that seems so intractable, so ugly, so beyond recovery, to the other most, in Hebrews 7.25, means God's forgiving, redeeming, restoring touch reaches down into the darkest crevices of our souls. Those places where we are most ashamed, most defeated, more than this, those crevices of sin are themselves the places where Christ loves us the most, his heart willingly, think about that, willingly goes there. Um, it re reminds me of this song. Um, I think we've, we've sang it here, right? Chrissy, oh, how he loves us. We've sang that song here before. I think it's a pretty popular song, whether or not your campuses have sung it before. You've probably heard it before on the radio. Oh, how he loves us, right? Uh, if you think about it, not a, not a super deep song on the surface until you start really thinking about the words. And I've always, whenever we, men, men, you'll probably appreciate this in our congregation. Whenever we sang that song, there's a lyric in there that's always weirded me out. 
a little bit. I'm like, what are we, what are we doing? What are we singing? Like, so it's a heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss. Okay, whatever. But it's the chorus that'll get you. The chorus goes, oh, how he loves us all. Oh, how he loves us all. How he loves us. Not very deep unless you actually think about it. And when you think about it, it plunges you to the depths of what the gospel is all about. That the God of the universe, perfect and holy and mighty, could give a rip about you and me. When we turned our back on him and sinned against him. His heart for you is not, let me get it right, fix you up, die for you on the cross, and then hope you get it all right. His heart for you is so amazing that he stays engaged even to this day, and he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Are you grateful for, for his, his salvation to the uttermost? Isn't that an amazing truth? It is. Because without it, you have no hope whatsoever. Literally no hope whatsoever. And not only do you not have any hope, but your faith would simply be about a historical event that was so monumental, so important, but have no relevancy for your life today. He didn't just save you in the past. He's saving you to the uttermost now. And guess what? This is the best part about it. He doesn't do it begrudgingly. Parents can probably relate to this. Moms, you can probably relate to that, right? You get get your son or daughter cleaned up, and it's like 10 minutes later. They're dirty. They're in a mess. They're getting into trouble. And, And I know you're probably perfect, but us dads are probably like, oh, man, begrudgingly. And Jesus doesn't do that begrudgingly, does he? I want you to consider this this verse from Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12 verses 2 through 3 says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, um, the pioneer and perfecter. Does that sound familiar? The author and the perfecter, the starter and the sustainer. Fixing our eyes on this Jesus for the joy, church, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorting its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. Consider him for a moment who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. Consider this Jesus. Consider this Jesus who for the joy set before him not only endured the cross for you, but sits down at the right hand of God and continues to do a work of joy on your behalf. That is amazing to think about. That that means that Jesus saves to the uttermost. And it also leads into the very next thing that he talks about in verse 25. The second question that I referred to, which which is our second point, which is this. Jesus intercedes for us right now. Something that perhaps you haven't really considered or thought about, but is so true and relevant to your in my life, in the Christian life. Verse 25 says he's able to save to the uttermost. He then goes on to say he always lives to make intercession for them. Uh, The word intercession simply means this. It means to stand in the gap of another's behalf. Um, It it can also mean to pray for. That's what that word means. And he's doing that right now, church. Like literally right now, that's what he's doing for you and for for me. And, and, And I think about that this week and it's like, well, why wouldn't he do that? Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. That, that's, I think, Hebrews 13, 5. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Here's what that means on a practical level. How we see Jesus and the New Testament respond to people who are weak, worn out, wayward sinners, the outcasts of society, is the same way he responds today. His heart has not changed the way that he approached the lepers, the outcasts, the tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes, the you fill in the blank, back in his day when he walked on this earth is the same way that he approaches you and I when we don't measure up, when we make mistakes, when we fall short, when we have the shame and, and sin of our life following us each and every day. He's not repelled or repulsed by you. He leans in 
and he embraces what you're going through. It's not like he ascended up into heaven and, and, you know, after the resurrection and then had a change of heart, change of mind. You know, from this perspective, these people are really gross. He doesn't do that. His heart is the same. What does he do? He, he intercedes. He prays for you. How would that change your perspective on life if you knew that Jesus, when you're going through the, the roughest, most darkest time in your life, Jesus is in the next room praying for you? Standing in the gap between your sin and God's holiness, not allowing one sin to stack up on another for you. That every time you sin, your sin kind of accumulates and Jesus wipes it off the table, leans over to his father and says, I died for that one. He's interceding for us. He intercedes for us. His heart doesn't change. The question is, do you know that? Do you like... Do you think about that? Do you know that Jesus is actually praying for you right now, standing and interceding, or I should say sitting and interceding on your behalf for your life? Imagine what that would do to your encouragement, to your perspective. Imagine what that would do if you carried that truth with you no matter what you went through, no matter what you were going through, no matter what you faced tomorrow. Imagine the fuel that would would fill your soul, your weary soul, to allow you to move forward each and every day knowing that Jesus is going to bat for you, going to battle for you, praying for you, lifting you up. What would that do? The Apostle Paul reminds us of this amazing truth in in Romans chapter 8, where he says this, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. That's an important concept. And then he says this. He says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. We know that, right? We already knew that. We we said that at the beginning of the message. We said, we know what Jesus has done. We know what Jesus did. But what is Jesus doing? So Paul says, Jesus Christ is the one who justifies. He's the one who died. But then he, look at this phrase that I highlighted. He says, but it's more than that. Christian, your, your faith in the gospel is more than just Jesus dying on the cross is as important as that is. It's more than that. It's more than that. It's it's more than the crucifixion. And and check this out. Who was raised, who is at the right hand of God. It's more than the, the resurrection even. And that's usually where people stop. Crucifixion, Jesus died for me and he rose from the dead for me. We celebrated that on Easter. But it's more than that. Paul says more than that. More than that, he set the right hand of God who was indeed interceding for us. Christ Jesus is literally interceding for us, something that you and I, if we are honest, don't give much thought and attention to. So here's the big idea. While it's essential to understand what Jesus has done for us in the past, it is vitally important for us to understand what Jesus is doing for us in the present moment. He's our intercessor, and he's also our justifier. He justifies us because of our sin. He justifies us because of what he's done on the cross, but he's our intercessor. And here's why this is important. Because Jesus is our intercessor, that that means that there's never a moment, think about this, there's never a moment in your life where you need to face life alone. If all that Jesus did was die on a cross for you, and let's say he did rise from the grave and ascended to heaven, but we have no idea what he's doing. The Bible talks about nothing what he's doing currently. We don't know that he's sitting at the right hand of God interceding for us. If all he did was die in the past, that still means you've got to face life by yourself. But because he's our intercessor, that means that you never have to face a moment in this life alone. You never have to carry the weight of your own condemnation by yourself. You never... You never have to wonder whether or not God is actually for you. And that is huge. I've talked to so many believers that because of their past, they kind of think that Jesus forgave them. And because of their present sin, they really wonder whether or not God is actually for them. They really struggle. Maybe this is you. You really struggle with the concept that if God is for us, who can be against us? Like, is God really, really for me? And the answer to that question, according to this passage, is absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. Not just in theory, not just in kind of what he does abstractly, but like his personal feelings towards you 
is yes, he loves you. He's for you. And some of you might respond to this message and say, well, okay, that's easy for you to say, Pastor Jeremy, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know how bad I messed up. You don't know how bad I'm messing up. You don't know how bad it's gotten. Okay, so let's talk about that. Let's play that out. Maybe you ask this question. What if you messed up really bad after coming to Christ? What if I really mess up really bad after coming to Christ? I, I can tell you my story, okay? I became a Christian at the end of my ninth grade year when I was about 15, 16 years old, and I was at a low point in my life. Uh, many of you have heard my testimony before. And, and Jesus saved me, and it was through an earth science teacher who shared the gospel, a public earth science teacher who shared the gospel with me, who shared Jesus with me, who shared the Bible with me. And it was at that moment in my life where it was like everything was different. Like the gospel was such, you know what the gospel means? It means good news. At that moment in my life, more than any other point in my life, the gospel was such good news. It was so refreshing. My eyes were open. I was invigorated. I had purpose and direction. It didn't mean all my problems went away, but I was like really, really excited about being a Jesus follower. So excited I would tell everybody. I wanted people to know the love of Jesus because of what he'd done in my life. But what if I told you, what if I told you that my biggest sins happened after becoming a Christian. By the way, it's not a hypothetical scenario. What if I told you my biggest fears, my biggest worries, my biggest doubts, um, probably the time in my life you know, where I was more angry at God than any other point, my biggest sins. If I told you they all came post-Jesus. For those of you who may be wondering, after you've let God down again and again, just another time I've let God down this week, if you've ever started wondering, does God, is God growing tired of me? Have you ever wondered if Jesus was growing weary of you? maybe second-guessing his decision to even save you in the first place. If you're going to screw it up that bad, I'm taking it back. If you've ever considered perhaps maybe he's growing reluctant in his approach to you because you're really not approaching him. The truth of Hebrews chapter 7 needs to flood your heart today. God is for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? He lives to make intercession. I don't know what you live to do. I know we all have different kinds of passions um, today. And that's cool. I love, you know, I'm passionate about certain things. And I talk about them a lot. You talk about, you know what Jesus is passionate about? You know what's on his mind 24-7? You know what's always on his, the topic of his conversation it's intercession for us. He lives to make intercession for us. And he's able, this is the good news, he's able to save to the uttermost. Meaning his work of intercession is not void. It doesn't fall short. It always accomplishes its purpose. As the Apostle John puts it in 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 1, he, he says this, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Like it, his hope is not that you become a Christian and then your worst sins come after you becoming a Christian. That's not his hope. But he says, if you do sin, if you do sin, if anyone does sin, now stop right there for a moment. Fill in the blank. You might not know this first. You might not know what it says after that. But, but what would it say according to how most people think about God when it comes to their own personal sin? If, if, if it was someone like that, they might, they might finish the sentence by saying this. If anyone does sin, they should feel ashamed. They should go on the rest of their life, not forgiving themselves, not being able to move forward, wallow in their tears, wallow in their shame. You are helpless. You are hopeless. There's no future for you. Give it up. You had your chance. God's done with you. If anyone does sin, some people would finish that verse with those words. Thank God the Apostle John does not. 
Thank God God doesn't write his word in those ways. This is what God says. He says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, an advocate, a lawyer who who stands in court on your behalf. It's a little bit different than an intercessor, and we don't have time to talk about the differences today, but the idea is you got Jesus going to bat for you. Because we have Jesus Christ, the righteous, we can be confident in our faith. We have Jesus, Jesus who was tempted in every way, yet didn't sin so he can go to bat for us. We have Jesus who is gentle and lowly in heart, so he doesn't look at sinners like you and me with disdain. He looks at them with compassion. We have Jesus, an advocate, who stands for you in front of God even in your darkest moments of life. This is who Jesus is, and that's what he does today. Not just yesterday. And we're thankful for that. His love and his work for you, in a similar way to a mom's, you know, if you've experienced this with your mom, it's never done. His heart is always towards you. His work is never done. I want to invite the worship teams to come forward. And uh, as, as I do, I know each campus has a different service order. But as we, as we continue with our worship service, I want to end by sharing a quote for, with you from the book. And, and it's a little bit long, but here's what I need every single person to do in this room and, and, and watching at all of our locations. I want you to think. This is the point in the message where I just got done sharing a lot of truth, a lot of information, but this is how it applies to you. And I thought these words were so powerful in the book that I wanted to end, but I need you to think and consider what this means for your own life. And this is what um, Dean Ortland says in his book. He says, consider your own life. Consider your own life. How do you think about Jesus' attitude toward that dark pocket of your life that only you know? The ever-dependence, over-dependence upon alcohol, The lost temper, time and time again. The shady business about your finances. The never people pleasing that looks to others like niceness, but you know well in your heart that it's just the fear of man. The entrenched resentment that burst out in behind the back accusations towards others just because you're bitter. The habitual use of pornography. Who is Jesus in those moments? Who is Jesus in those moments of spiritual blankness? Not who is he once you conquer that sin, but who is he in the midst of it? The Apostle John says he stands up and defies all accusers. His, his heart is one that stands and speaks in our defense when we sin, not after we get over it. And in that sense, his advocacy of you is as a, as a self a conquering of it. He then says, we are indeed called to forsake our sins and no healthy Christian would suggest otherwise. That's an important distinction of what we're talking about today. When we choose to sin, we forsake our true identity as a child of God. We invite misery into our lives, and we displease our Heavenly Father. We are called to mature into deeper levels of personal holiness as we walk with the Lord, truer consecration, new vistas of obedience. But when we don't, when we don't, when we choose to sin, though we forsake our true identity, our Savior never forsakes us. These are the very moments when his heart erupts on our behalf in renewed advocacy in heaven with a resounding defense that silences all accusations, astonishes the angels, and celebrates the Father's embrace of us in spite of our messiness. 
Are there any messy people here today? You got some sin and baggage and some shame in your past? Join the club, right? I love the phrase that we sometimes use at church. We're a perfect church for those who aren't. And the reason why we can all gather together in all of our sin, in all of our background, in all of our baggage is because of the love of Jesus Christ who didn't just leave his love on the cross or in a tomb, but put it at the right hand of God and intercedes on your behalf to this day. And if that doesn't make your heart rejoice, I don't know what will. His work for you is never done because his love for you is never finished, church. So we have an opportunity at most of our campuses to respond in in worship and praise to our great God. And so let's prepare our hearts for that. Father, thank you so much for your love for us. It's hard to put into words what that love means and what it's accomplished and what it's doing now. And I know from this passage and in preparation for this message, me personally, and I hope my brothers and sisters in Christ as well, that you're renewing my mind to understand what you're doing in the present moment for me. That I'm not just relying on you for an act of salvation on the cross in the past, but I'm relying on an act of mercy and grace every single day in my life to this very day. I need you, Jesus. We need you. Thank you for your heart and your posture towards us to not cast us aside or grow weary because of our sin and shortcomings, but you continue to pursue us. We love you for that, Lord. And it's in your precious name we pray this. Amen.